Hello everyone, this is Space Cafe Podcast, and I'm Marcus. So, remember those geometry lessons from school? The circles, the parallels, tangents, and all that. Well, it turns out we were learning about more than just shapes. We were stepping into the world of a Greek genius, a mastermind named Euclid and his system Euclidean geometry. Euclid wrote a book called Elements, a 13-volume work that's like a greatest hits of ancient Greek math. It's full of ideas that have shaped our world and how we understand it. So Euclid came up with some simple but powerful ideas, like a point is that which has no part. A line is breathless length. The ends of a line are points. These ideas have been the building blocks for so much of what we do today, from inventing new things to building skyscrapers. But there has always been a question that bugged me. Euclidean geometry is perfect and precise, but our world isn't. What does it mean in real life that a line ends in a point and that point has no size? Where are the perfect circles in nature? Then came along non-Euclidean geometries, a new way of thinking about space that helped Einstein realize that the universe isn't just a box holding everything together. It's more like a fabric woven together called space-time. But here's the thing. Even though this idea is over 100 years old, it seems like it's still not widely understood. We still talk about time. We still talk about space as if they are separate things, not part of the same fabric. Popular culture has not yet adopted to those more than 100-year-old understandings. Without understanding space-time, we wouldn't be on the edge of discovering some of the universe's biggest secrets, like gravitational waves, ripples in the fabric of space-time that are changing how we see the universe. So, my friends, get ready for a mind-bending journey into the world of gravitational waves with our special guest, Dr. Laura Nuttall. She's a top researcher in gravitational waves, a senior lecturer at the University of Portsmouth, and a key player at the LIGO scientific collaboration. Her work is helping us uncover the next secrets of the universe. So sit back, relax, and join us as we explore the universe with Dr. Nuttall, diving into the ripples in space-time that are changing how we understand the universe. Welcome to the Space Cafe podcast. Laura, we met at the Royal Society um, a while ago. We did. That's a pretty fancy place, by the way. Have you? Are you a regular visitor of the Royal Society or member, maybe even? Mm, not a member, um, and I'm certainly not. Um, I think more senior enough to be um, like a fellow of the Royal Society or anything yet. I think it's one of those aspiration things that most scientists do have. Um, I've been a few times for various different reasons to present at conferences, but they also have like the summer. Royal Society Summer Exhibitions, where you sometimes showcase your research to the public. Yeah. That's always a lot of fun. So I've, d I've done that. Uh, that so it's once. on your bucket list. Well, to be a member, definitely. Be be becoming a fellow. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And <laughs> um, my father in law is actually a chemist and who is a fellow of the Royal Society. So, you know, it's one of those things as well. See if we can wow. get a family tradition going with a few of us in the Royal Society. There's a little bit of pressure. <laughs> Maybe. It's one of those things that would be lovely if that's the case, but never mind if not. Um, like you said, it's a rather fancy yes. place. It's always nice to visit. Yeah, absolutely. So the um, you were part of a, a very, very interesting panel, a panel of, of astrophysicists and uh, particle physicists talking about the current state of affairs in both worlds. So astrophysics being the large view of everything and particle physics being the microscopic view of everything. Is there any rivalry between the two of you? Um, I think our science is different enough that there's certainly, if you like, rivalry in terms of like, you know, I'm, I've got a really interesting discovery, I've got really interesting results, certainly. In terms of funding and things like that, I think we're different enough. And like I said, looking for slightly different things. I think it's just such nice complementary information. It's different, yeah. 
Yeah. Like, for instance, the way that I look for gravitational yeah. waves, I'm looking for like the wave parts of the gravitational wave. Um, my experiments, mm. what I know, doesn't really lend itself to trying to find the graviton or something like the particle equivalent of gravity, which is definitely mm. in their alley. Mm. Well, I'd be honest, so do, I'd love it if they did find do you, it. Do you understand what particle physicists do? Do they understand you? How how the how is communication between the two worlds? Um, that's a really interesting question. Like we've all done like university level physics and things like that, so I I have a hand wavy sure. idea of, like of what they've done and stuff. Um, in terms of like reading one of their papers, um, I definitely won't be able to understand everything in it. I don't think and all the subtleties and intricacies that they do. We tend to meet at more general conferences and things like that. Like I said, the general astrophysics conference. Um. For instance, recently there was the National Astronomy Meeting here in the UK. So that brings together astronomers, mm -hmm. astrophysicists from a wide variety of different fields. And it can be sometimes really interesting just to hear, if you like, the latest results from people and stuff like that. Um, I remember I got up early, I lived mm -hmm. in the States at the time when it was the announcement of the Higgs boson, because it's, you know, it's really interesting. It's really, mm -hmm. really cool. And, you know, I can understand little bits of it. I can, I'm very happy sometimes to talk about it to the general public. Um, I certainly couldn't talk to it at a research level, though. <laughs> Absolutely. But both worlds are in the business of trying to understand why we, not why we're here, but what we're made of, what matter is made of, where everything comes from. So the goal, the noble goal, is the same for both worlds, right? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think anybody doing some form of like astrophysics, you know, looking up in the sky in some sense, like you said, is just trying to find answers to really almost anything. Um, I might argue that the particle physicists are trying to figure out, if you like, what things are made of. Like, I might be trying to figure out, if you like, what proportion mm -hmm. of things are made of in the universe. Like, you know, how, what proportion of the universe is dark mass and what proportion is the dark energy. It might be the particle physicists actually trying to figure out exactly what that is, um, mm -hmm. for instance. Um, they might have the experiments that might be able to we produce certain conditions or something like that, let's say. But like you said, we're all in it, we're all in it for the same gig, really. We're just really, <laughs> really interested and in just really trying to figure out what's going on. At the extremes, at the fringes of both disciplines, do both meet and merge at the very end? <laughs> I bet we will. Um, it kind of, kind of comes down to this idea of like a grand unified theory of sorts, isn't it? Um, right now, gravity is really not well understood I think we're happy to say like for instance mm. we understand it on the large scale thanks to Einstein um, if you like on the local scales we've got Newton um, but we really don't mm. know what's happening at the quantum scales let's say and I think that's something where we need to kind of join both fields in some sense and t um, extremely clever people much cleverer than I am for instance who will be thinking about these different theories and how to test them and stuff um, mm. and it'll take a bringing together different disciplines and different approaches to different things so I bet that's one way in which we'll meet, let's say. Hmm. That's very interesting because in an earlier episode on this show, we had a person in the business of building inflatable structures for uh, for orbit, for future space habitats, etc. And, and he said, oh. in fact, we can build almost anything, but the tricky part, the thing we cannot replicate is artificial gravity. And... Do you think that not understanding what gravity is is blocking us from being able to create artificial gravity? Um, do you think that once we understand it, we will be able to to do it? Um, I don't think it's... Yeah, um, it's a really interesting way to think about it, to be honest, because I think we can understand what's happening with gravity to to a point, given what we currently understand about it. Like, for instance, what Newton said about gravity is right up to a limit. And then we need what Einstein says and what he said about gravity up to a limit. So if you like, it's not wrong, it just has its limitations. So mm -hmm. I don't really know a great deal about artificial gravity, certainly. But um, I can, like you said, I can totally appreciate where you're coming from in terms of saying to understand something completely, we can then replicate it or we mm -hmm. can um, think about it in different ways. So mm -hmm. mm, I don't know if artificial... I, I, I might, I might naively say that artificial gravity is a, a large-scale kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I would hope that we would be able to do that. I think we just haven't got the technology quite yet to do mm -hmm. it. It's in a very similar way to gravitational waves. When Einstein first postulated it, he just never thought we'd actually be able to find them. Yeah. He thought the technology yeah. would be beyond us. And it just took on the order of a, of a century yeah. in order for us to be clever enough to actually do it. So I think 
give humans enough time, we can work out a heck of a lot of stuff. <laughs> Let's go back to the Royal Society panel a couple of weeks mm -hmm. ago. Where is research at at the moment? How much do we know of everything? Oh, I don't think we know a lot at all. Um, I think that's a wonderful thing about physics. There's so much to continually answer. I think it's things like looking back at our predecessors, for instance, who suddenly thought like, you know, we know what the universe is made of, let's move on. And actually, once we kind of like unlock the door for dark energy and things like that, we actually realize, heck, we haven't got a clue what's going on and that's <laughs> going to take a heck of a lot of time to figure out. So there's plenty to keep us busy. I will certainly say that, but I think every time we unlock something, there's just more and more things to discover. In my field, for instance, it was just getting over detecting gravitational waves. Now that we've got over that hurdle, now there's all these other kind of like avenues, these other doors that we've opened. And to be honest, it's just a matter of time and person power, really, and some really bright people to actually mm. go down certain avenues and understand it in that bit more. So... I guess for anybody listening, thinking about a career, you're never going to be bored in physics. There's just so much to <laughs> always constantly do. You'll, we'll, we'll never have the answers to everything. Um, I think that's the nice thing about it. Does uh, physics have enough experts, young researchers? Is there enough influx of talent? I think there's some really, like, I see a lot of it now with incoming PhD students and um, sometimes postdocs as well, just this kind of like fire and excitement for the subject that I think some of us who've been around a little bit are a little bit more um, tired maybe is the word. I'm not really too sure to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, but I love um, seeing like people come in and just their energy and just their ideas. Um, at the moment, I think I'd probably say there's probably, in, in terms of academia, there's more people um, than there are if you like jobs available, which is a shame. But being a physicist doesn't mean being an academic. It's wonderful mm -hmm. to see people branch off and use their talent in so many different forms of industry, for instance, and push that side of... Um, science in 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 uh, yeah like i said an industry setting so mm -hmm. i think while this um while society can if you like afford to have um people thinking and pushing frontiers in certain ways there's always going to be the talent to nurture it really mm. tell us a little bit about yourself how you ended up wanting to <laughs> spend your the rest of your life with the gravitational waves Yeah, it's one of these weird things that every now and again you meet people in a pub and say that I look for black holes for a living and no one believes you. Or they just think, <laughs> you know, you've wanted to do that forever. Um, and I can't really claim that I wanted to do it forever. Like, I didn't come from a very academic background. My mum worked in a hospital and my dad's an electrician. Um, neither had gone to university, but my dad had a real passion for maths, which he kind of instilled in me. And I think I was just really looking for something that would I could stick my teeth into, and like I said, that wouldn't keep, wouldn't ever get me bored. So when I was thinking about university, it kind of came down to physics. I like the application of maths rather than doing a pure maths background. And I'd certainly never heard about gravitational waves when I went to university. Um, I remember when the first time I've heard about them, it was in a second year optics lesson. Um, mm -hmm. My lecturer was talking about some crazy contraption in Germany that was trying to measure ripples in the fabric of space time. And he was hmm. describing how the geodetector worked. And I just thought it was utterly marvelous and bonkers that at the time I used a very rudimentary internet to kind of find out a little bit more about it and go to the library to understand more. And I think it was just what I needed at the time. I think I realized about the second or third year of studies that I wanted to do more. I wanted to go on to do a PhD if I, if I was lucky enough to find a space. But um, I didn't really know what area excited me the most and I think it was when I heard about gravitational waves that that was it I was kind of hooked and uh, luckily I got a PhD in the area and I think I've just again been lucky at the right points in my career that opportunities have arisen and I've just and I've just never left the field I've just been I've been hmm. researching gravitational waves now since oh for about 14 years let's let's get this thing out of the way now what are gravitational waves <laughs> yeah there are They're very, it's a very odd concept and certainly not something that you think about all the time. So the definition is that gravitational waves are ripples in the fabric of space-time. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of going on in that, just like one sentence. Um, so I like to try to break it down a little bit. So to understand gravitational waves, you have to understand what Einstein says about gravity. And what he says is that gravity is actually a curvature of space-time. It's not a force in the way that we kind of a taught about gravity in school. Um, 
it's not something that's if you like sticking us down to the earth or something like that. It's actually all due to this substance called space time and how it bends and curves and the characteristics of those bendings and curvings dictate the strength of gravity. So for instance, is that analogy with that ball on that cloth and and curving that piece of cloth uh, on in its path is this an analogy a valid analogy? I think so, certainly yes. Um I like to think of if you like what space time is in terms of something like a trampoline a, a stretchy substance that has a bit of um that has a bit of give but you know is is a bit stiff. So if you like I said if you put a ball in the middle of a trampoline or something it'll bend around the ball and how massive the ball is how much mass it has will dictate how much grab it, how much the trampoline curves take away the ball mm. and put something more massive there let's say me i will cause space i was called the trampoline to bend even more around me it'll be more steeper if you can probably mm. imagine and that steepness is what's dictating the strength of gravity and so if you have something that's really massive say the sun or something like that it'll cause space time to bend an extreme amount and that's what's keeping the earth stuck in the orbit around the sun it's this mm -hmm. curvature with the idea of curvature so mm -hmm. in a similar way that a boat moves through water and produces ripples if an object is moving through the space time excuse me it'll cause ripples in the fabric of space time that will propagate away from the source and they travel at the speed of light so really anything that travels through space time will produce gravitational waves so you have to indulge me mm -hmm. and imagine that i'm waving my hands at you right now I will be producing gravitational waves because my hands are moving through space-time. They're, ex they're accelerating, decelerating. Mm, sure. They'll just be extremely, extremely weak. Um, it's really like the densest, um, most massive, and things that are traveling at very close to the speed of light that produce, if you like, the biggest, densest curvatures in space-time, such as black holes, the dead remnants of stars. There's, their gravity is so great that light can't escape from them. And so you can imagine in your mind that a black hole might cause, if you like, a massive well, so steep, in fact, that nothing can escape it. And it's that steepness which is dictating the strength of the gravity. And so if you can imagine a black hole, and then I slam another black hole into it, this will cause, if you like, a massive disruption of space-time and a massive eruption of ripples in a similar way that you might throw a rock into a pond or something. And that's kind of the system that I'm looking for. I'm looking for these explosions that happen when two black holes collide with each other. And I'm picking up the ripples here on Earth to understand huh. what caused the, those ripples in the first place. So, yeah, it's a weird and cool job. I'd love to find out how that measuring process works and what kind of hardware you need for it and how. But be, before asking that question, I find it highly interesting that you're very easily talking about space-time because this is a concept that you need on a daily basis in your profession. And it's been around ever since Einstein. That's a hundred years, more than a hundred years ago. And still, it's not a concept that has found its way into our everyday life, okay. in, into our everyday lives. We, we still talk about space and we still talk about time, but never about space time. That's very interesting that this has not found its way into everyday life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How's that to you? I guess as somebody that, like you said, deals with it all the time, I kind of just kind of switch my brain on for work and kind of switch it off. It's just like, for instance, like right now when I'm chatting to you, I'm wearing a watch. I keep time very separate to my location, if you know what I mean. So it's the idea that mm -hmm. right now, I am sat stationary, so my X, Y, Z position is fixed, but I'm moving through space time because time is ticking for every second. And it's just sure. it's just those ideas that we don't need them for our everyday life here on Earth. Like gravity isn't very strong. We're not traveling close to the speed of light. The only time that we kind of really need these concepts is things like GPS. Um so mm -hmm. Google Maps would be terribly wrong if we didn't actually understand what Einstein says about gravity and think about it in this way and think about, you know, the signal from your So phone. with Newton's equations, there would be no GPS. It'd be completely wrong. Um, so it needed Einstein's equations. Yeah, it'd be completely wrong. Mm -hmm. So it's just things, for instance, like the signal, for instance, let's say bouncing off a satellite or something like that, coming back to you, it actually has to travel out of the gravitational well of the Earth to get to the satellite and back to you, for instance. And so you've got to think about things like that or... Um, 
it's a lot to do with the timing. It, the timing would be off in terms of like you telling, if you like, the satellite where your position was and stuff like that because of the gravity of the Earth. It's very subtle. It's not very much, but it's enough that the effects would really propagate. And so you'd be out by kilometers if you didn't actually have, hmm. um, if, if Einstein's theory of gravity wasn't, if you like, built into GPS. Uh, it feels like humans took the easy route to make nature understandable and they segmented nature apart. Uh, so nature has always been a amalgamation of everything. And, and we, in order to be able to understand it, we separated time from space because otherwise we wouldn't understand that concept. Uh -huh. And there is, no, there is no equivalent to time and space in reality. Yeah, I think that's a very fair point, really. I think we've constructed, if you like, a system that works for us. And now we're trying to understand the universe according, if you like, to our system. And so I think, like you said, as we start to learn more, like we did with Einstein 100 years ago, where we've actually got to meld those ideas together to understand it fully, um, then we'd have to rechange our definitions. So we don't really teach that in school because it's not really very important for everyday life to understand the planets orbiting around the the sun you can get a decent enough um idea with what newton says about gravity you don't really need to understand what einstein says so that's why i feel like we teach it at university um for people really delving into the ideas but i'm sure when we understand what quantum gravity is it'll be in, like you said a completely different coordinate system but again i don't know whether no if i'd have to learn it because if i don't need it for what i'm doing it might just be something mm. that, if you know, it'd be on it, not a need to know basis, let's say, but you know, it's just, do you need to know it? There's so much to know. We can only have so much time to learn things. And is it worth learning absolutely everything in intricate detail? And I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Certainly for mm. the interest of learning, wonderful, but I don't know if we'll ever be teaching quantum gravity in school. I'm wondering if in different parts of the world, there is a different understanding of what we're talking about. Maybe it's a European, Western, academic way of thinking and seeing that world. Uh, I'd be super interested in finding out if there are different kinds of legitimate thoughts out there that integrate time and space from the cradle already. Mm -hmm. But maybe maybe I'm not making sense right now. I think I understand what you're saying. Um, I think a lot of, obviously, what we do is dictated by, um, at least, if you like, how science was communicated um, back in, either now or back in, um, back a century ago or something like that. It was very dictated, if you like, by Western um, kind of um, publications and stuff like that. And obviously, at some point, we switch from individual languages to most publications now are in English. So, um, mm -hmm. um, very, uh, at least the major journals that I can think of, let's say, so in terms of communicating to other scientists or to other cultures in some sense, it's very much, I think, being dominated by, by, by our side of the world. Whereas, like you said, there could be other cultures that like you said, do this automatically. And I wouldn't actually know how, about, how we'd go about finding that out. And they, and they would go like, why didn't you ask us in the first place? We could have told you how that works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so black holes collide, create ripples in space-time, and Laura is able to measure um, the waves. How on earth does that work? <laughs> um, yeah, so I can't pick them up myself. Um, they're far too weak to actually pick up for any individual person. Um so I have to use, if you like, massive microphones that are called interferometers. And there's actually a few located around the world. The main ones that I work with are called LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And there are two of them in the United States. So it's not like a conventional telescope mm -hmm. that has mirrors and you point it to a point, a part of the sky and you collect the photons, the light or the x-rays or the microwaves or whatever part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Gravitational waves can travel through anything. and so. You don't have to point it in a sense. So that's where the microphone idea comes in. So this idea of an interferometer is um, my instruments look like a massive L if you actually put, it, put their names into Google Maps. 
Mm-hmm. And very welcome to do that. If you actually put LIGO Hanford or LIGO Limited into Google Maps and um, you zoom in, you'll just see these massive L-shaped instruments. They're actually four kilometers in length each wow. arm. And so what you're doing is you're firing the laser beam and if you like to the very middle of the laser, the L shape. And here there's an instrument called, um, mm-hmm. sorry, an optic called a beam splitter. And it's splitting the laser light into two. One part of the laser travels up one mm-hmm. arm and the other part of the laser travels up the other arm, which are 90 degrees to each other. They bounce off mirrors mm-hmm. at the very end, at the end of the four kilometers. They travel back and then they recombine again at the beam splitter. And then you're trying then to read out if, if a gravitational wave has come by. And so to measure how a gravitational wave comes by, a big property of what gravitational waves do is if they, as they're moving through space-time, they stretch and squeeze it as they go through it. So if a gravitational wave is coming in or out of the wall in front of you right now, it would stretch it along one axis and squeeze it along the corresponding 90-degree axis. So if it was passing through me right now... So, so that would mean if I had a ruler right here in front of me measuring centimeters and millimeters Mm -hmm. if a gravitational wave passes through me and the ruler the millimeter scale would be different in that moment yes that's exactly it so if it's passing through me or you right now it will say cause in one part of the wave cycle it would cause if you like my height to increase and my waist to decrease and in another part of the cycle i would be a little bit short and a bit wider so if you got to think of it like a plus and the plus is breathing and that's kind of the effect that a gravitational wave might have huh. coming in or out of in or out of like you, for instance. And so we take advantage of that kind of stretching and squeezing nature. And so if you have this big L shape, if you're actually measuring the laser as it goes up and down these arms, if a gravitational wave comes by, it might cause the length of one arm to slightly shrink and the length of another arm to slightly increase. And so the laser going up and down each arm will travel slightly different distances. And those distances mm-hmm. is what, and those slightly shifts in distances is what you actually be able to pick up. But we're actually a massive timing experiment. We're looking for shifts in the frequency of the laser. We're looking at the phase difference of the laser in one arm compared to mm-hmm. the other. I think the nicest way to think mm-hmm. about this is imagine two rows of soldiers marching perfectly in time with each other. They go to a beam splitter. They split up into two, um, two paths. Once a set of soldiers goes up the vertical arm, let's say another um, line of soldiers goes along the horizontal arm. They both march four kilometers, turn around and come back and they meet. So if you set up your interferometer so that both arms are the same length, they both travel eight kilometers, they meet back up, so they're still marching perfectly in time. If a gravitational wave comes by, mm. it'll change that path length ever so slightly. So one line of soldiers will travel a slightly shorter distance to the soldiers in the other arm. And so when they meet up, they'll be marching slightly out of time with each other. And this slightly out of timeness tells us what type of gravitational wave has actually come by. And so this is how we can actually determine the size of the black holes, where they are on the sky, um, and some of the intrinsic properties about them and stuff like that. It's a very very distinct fingerprint, if you like. And that's what it is that we can measure. It sounds bonkers. And when I first started it, talking about this, uh, like over a decade ago, when I mentioned that the arms in my detectors changed by something like 10 to the minus 18 meters by two colliding black holes, <laughs> that's usually the response I get. People laugh at me because 10 to, the, 10 to the minus 18 meters is crazy, crazy tiny. Like, you know, the tiniest, I think, part of your body, like, you know, the nucleus of an atom, is about 10 to the minus 15 meters, you know, like an electron or something like that in your body. It's a thousand times smaller than that. It's absolutely bizarre to think that we're clever enough as humans to build technology to pick up that tiny length change. And we can very much pick up this length change in the instruments in the United States. There's one in Italy. There's one in Japan. And so if we see them from various locations across the world, we can easily and happily say it came from up there in space and not caused by an earthquake or a car or something like that. Um, this is, as you said, completely bonkers. And and how on earth do you pitch such a project to any kind of investor out there? <laughs> you would you would tell the investor, so there is black holes colliding, and we think because Einstein proposed it that there could be ripples in space time, and they are very very small. Um, so 
How do you pitch something like this to investors? Oh, I, I have heard stories about this from various colleagues that have been in the field a very, very long time. Um, I think it was, because um, obviously it takes a massive international effort and a massive amount of cash coming from, like, you know, national, yes. like, national science foundations from each country or something like that. And I think it was just the the craziness of the idea, but it was just on this side, it was crazy in terms of like, such high impact if it worked but it was just if you like believable um for instance mm. if we think about the people that won the nobel prize in physics for the discovery of gravitational waves you got one guy kip thorne he was one of the major players at the time who thought about the theory two neutron stars two black holes or something like that colliding and mm. we knew neutron stars exist we have pulsars and so they should in theory collide and we've had various evidences of like um, these things being in binary systems and things like that. So in, there should be gravitational waves from these things. Um, so that's one aspect. Kip Thorne, because that's Kip Thorne, Ray Weiss was um, someone who really thought about the instrumentation and actually thought the ways in which you can beat down the noise of these instruments in order to make that measurement. And then Barry Barris was the person that could actually bring together a collaboration of many, many hundreds of different scientists in order to build the community and build the tools and the effort to actually do all of this. So yeah, it's it's mad, it's crazy, but I think it was just this side of believable that it captured people's imaginations. Why is it important? Why would we build such machines, such detectors? Can we make money with gravitational waves? I think in terms of gravitational waves directly, no. That's definitely the... If that's definitely if you like the blue sky idea like you know we just we want to figure out what the world is or if you like what the universe is and stuff like that which is really nice and poetic but really that's not really how you sell it but um probably what i would say is kind of like the technologies that we have developed along the way of the way that we've trained people to make these detections have then gone off and done some utterly amazing things in industry and so the precision lasers that we have to make for our instruments, I think I've been using various bits of medical technology and stuff like that. We have to mm. isolate parts of our detectors to such precision. We have some fantastic thermal, um, sorry, some um, seismic isolations and things like that. And, and the algorithms and things like that that we have developed in order to make these detections can actually be used in a, in a wide variety of things. Um, really, especially in my research area, I think I would class myself more as a data analysis, an analyst, sorry. Um, these skills are very, very widely used in different areas. I have colleagues that have gone on to work in various different technologies. And I know one person, for instance, that went to go and work for a company that actually looks at finding your fingerprint on a screen to make touchscreen work. And so that's kind of what we do in a sense. Mm. We're kind of looking for those fingerprints in our data. So you just apply those skills in a slightly different way and it's all, it comes out really well. So whilst you don't directly make money out of gravitational waves, I think I would probably say, in the same way for any other big science project, the technologies that you develop and the training of people that you do and the leaps that you make to actually do this kind of research can be applied to many other aspects of our lives. Uh, this is maybe a major and important aspect of science communication to make clear that big science and big science investments in big science uh, have collateral spin-off benefits that are relevant to society. So it doesn't really matter what the machine is for. Mm -hmm. So it's it's for the fun of science, it's for the fun of knowledge acquisition, but it doesn't really matter. Um, what matters to society is the spin-off technologies. So in fact, it, you can build any kind of crazy technology, like currently at CERN, where there is lots of discussion about the follow-up collider. Mm -hmm. And that would cost, obviously, lots of money. And people will ask what this investment is good for and why there's not different investments and whatnot. So, in fact, what you're saying, it doesn't really matter what is built because it will always produce spin-off technologies that make my smartphone better, that make my TV sharper or whatnot. Yeah, I definitely think so. And it's just, if you try and pin down now what that will be, I don't think I'm the best person to think about that. Like obviously some people will, but what I would say is that because academia typically has this freedom to push in different areas, we can push and find an idea 
And obviously we tell the world about it. We write papers, we go to conferences and talk about it. And then it just takes somebody with a, with a bit of, if you like, entrepreneurship to go, that's a really cool idea. You know what? This would really mm. work for this thing. And that's how, like, you know, spin off um, mm. startup companies are made, for instance, and things like that. You know, taking ideas that have come from seeds for usually big, very big experiments and taking it in direction then to make our lives easier in a, in a fashion. So, so yeah, um, I think I'll, I have to do a bit of Googling, but I'm fairly certain there's a decent amount of medical stuff that's kind of come out of this, for instance. Um, so, yeah, it's just, it's really interesting to have a bit of a think about what could come out of the future science it is that we're thinking about, like you said, whether it's past physics, gravitational waves, um, some of the big massive telescopes that are being built around the world. I, I do very much and firmly believe that there will be societal benefits, not just for the, you know, the wondrous nature of being human and looking up, Absolutely. but for the, the, you know, making our lives easier in some fashion. Do you look at the latest um, publications from the James Webb Telescope, the latest imagery? Oh, they're so pretty. Um, yeah, so there's something called the archive that most um, researchers look at every day just to kind of see what science and things mm. are coming out. There's too many things to keep up with every single day, so you have to pick and choose what you read and stuff. But yeah, it's always it's always yeah. really nice for a nice dose of like, oh, that's nice. And, you know, like, again, just that dose of wonder sometimes. I think even though I look for black holes, which are really cool, yes. you get bogged down in the um, in the specifics of exactly what your job is, no matter what your job is. And so every now and again, it's really nice to be reminded just how cool the universe is and, you know, what cool discoveries other people are making at that time. I was going to go back to, to that notion of those very, very small wobblings of space-time. That would ultimately mean that space we're being surrounded by right now, 24-7, is a dynamic something. It's not a static space. So it's, it's permanently wobbling on very, very small scales and, and, sh and, and bending and, and, and changing shape. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I guess you've got a, have a bit of an idea that um, space-time is really stiff. You know, it's not as like, flexible as a trampoline is the analogy that I gave. It's just the nicest way I like to think about it. It's actually the tensile strength of, um, of space-time is actually really, really crazy. So it, it takes a lot to really bend it, let's say. So if you know it, it kind of, quote unquote, might snap back fairly easily. But as you had just mentioned, there's so many different things going on in the universe. There's so many black holes colliding and other things going on. that There's going to be this constant, if you like, hum, the hum of gravitational waves or something like that going on. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's what some colleagues from Pulsar Timing Array communities recently found and recently told the world about. They picked up the background hum of all these things colliding using a slightly different experiment to what I use. And again, very, very exciting. So they think they find the background home from all these, if you like, superposition of black holes and things colliding. But we do also think there should be like a background home, if you like, from the, the Big Bang, the very first universe parts of the universe. But the home would be a bit different to the collision of all the black holes and things like that. And that wasn't detected, but hopefully it will be in the future. Do you think that gravitational waves expand or have the potential to expand our understanding of the universe and how might they influence our future exploration of space? Do you think there's any relevance outside academia? Hmm. So there's always something that me and a friend always like to have a bit of a chat about. Um, my friend Erin um, actually I'll, I'll put it in a click here. Dr. Erin McDonald is now actually a science writer um, for various shows in the United States. Um, and one thing that we sometimes postulate mm -hmm. or like to think about is, could gravitational waves be used for something like the warp drive or something like that in Star Trek or something like that? Because it's the idea that you yeah. could compress space-time in front of the ship and then expand it behind mm -hmm. you and then that would allow you to go faster than light travel. Yeah. It would put a faster than light travel, let's say. So you have to understand a way mm -hmm. to be able to do that. Could you accelerate some matter, some really dense matter, such as, say, neutron star matter, in such a way that you could create this, if you like, bubble that would allow you to contract and expand space-time in just the right manner? Now, what I'm saying sounds absolutely mad, but also 100 years ago, detected gravitational waves sounded absolutely mad. So, again, I don't put it 
I don't, I don't want to put it past the ingenuity of humans to actually think about how to do this, for instance, in the future. Um, gravitation mm-hmm. waves will actually, will, is, is opening a new way for us to understand and explore the universe. It's a very different way of looking at the universe than electromagnetic waves. So there's an electromagnetic spectrum that goes all the way from, like, from radio waves up to gamma rays, and we've unlocked the whole part of it to understand the universe in, in that lens. We have not unlocked the full part of the gravitational wave spectrum. We've only started unlocking two parts of it right now. I look at things at the very high frequencies. But at the lower end of frequencies will actually be these gravitational waves left over from the Big Bang and things like that. So we've got all the spectrum yet to unlock to understand what the heck is going on. And I think in the same way that you're saying previously, which is like to understand things fully, we need to understand the theory in full. I would probably argue to understand gravitational waves, we've got to unlock the full spectrum. And then we can really probably have a bit of a think about if, if, it, if we could harness it in, in any way, for instance, to, to, mm-hmm. yeah, to, to maybe help us get to the size of the universe or something like that. I don't really yeah. know. Mm-hmm. How often does LIGO take measurements uh, or observe gravitational waves? Well, so right now, as we're talking, the instruments are taking data. So with the Higgs boson, let's say, you're quite fortunate in some sense because you're accelerating particles to try and create a Higgs boson. Um, I can't create gravitational yeah. waves here on Earth. There's nothing that w- would be able to, there's nothing big enough, if you like, or nothing that I can speed up fast enough that mm. will produce gravitational waves that we can detect with the current technology that we have. So I'm at the mercy of mm. nature. I'm, looking for, I'm waiting for serendipity. So... By making our instruments more sensitive, we can see deeper into the universe and pick up more sources, more signals. So when we first turned on these instruments in 2015, well, we're probably detecting them on the order of once a month. And now we're currently in a science run, which is called Mm. the fourth observing run, and we can detect something. We're detecting something on average every few days. So we've definitely Mm. gone from, if you like, the initial detection phase now to the observing phase. And... Every few days, events are wow. coming on the order of every few days. Events are coming through. So wh- why is that? Because you calibrated the machine, or is it that you know what you're looking for? Um, I guess in a sense we know what we're looking for. So if you like, we've got a bit of a better idea. Still not a very good idea about the rate that black holes and neutron stars merge. Let's say, but really it's the technology that we've employed. Mm-hmm. We've um, got more advanced lasers, more advanced mirrors. Um, I think the seismic technology is about the same. But, you know, we've just got more clever with our hardware and stuff. And so we always intended to do a series of upgrades. Mm-hmm. And these upgrades take it on the order of a year or two to do. So, you know, you, you really only want to do them if you know you're going to see a net improvement. So really, well, our sensitivity region is from 10 hertz up to a few kilohertz or something like that. So it's all about pushing down the noise mm. and increasing our sensitivity. And so this is where you need not only, say, data scientists like me to actually analyze the data, but you need amazing engineers, material scientists and things like that to be able to actually think of ways in which to improve the Hmm. instrument in what might seem a very, very small way but has a very dramatic effect. Would changing the size of the detector make any major difference? So building the mother of all gravitational wave detectors, like, (laughs) let's not make it four kilometers, let Let's make it 40 or 400 kilometers. Would that make a difference? It would. So the 40 kilometers that you're mentioning is a project that's currently going on <laughs> called the Cosmic Explorer Project. Or that's, if you like, a future project that, mm. like you said, we want to make the next generation mm-hmm. of gravitational wave detectors. So Cosmic Explorer is um, being pitched to the American National Science Foundation as like um, at least one 40 kilometer long arm of the instrument. And what that does is that pushes down mm-hmm. your sensitivity a little bit at lower frequencies, but not a great deal. But arm length is a decent proxy for sensitivity of a gravitational wave detector. So mm-hmm. that's one thing that's happening. Uh, that if you like the um, let's go with um, let's be a detector to be proposed to be put in the United States in the order of about a decade or so. In Europe, we are also um, proposing what's called the Einstein telescope, which is actually going to be a ten-kilometer triangle. So rather than an L shape, it's going to be a triangle. 10 kilometers put underground um, and so that will help with the low frequency side of the um, the sensitivity. Hmm. Where would that be built? So there's a couple of sites that are being proposed at the moment. I think one's in Sardinia and another site is being proposed mm-hmm. on the 
let's see if I get all the countries right, the Dutch, Belgian, and German border. So near um, Maastricht mm-hmm. in in the in the mm-hmm. in the Netherlands. So um, mm-hmm. so I, they're the two sites that I know that be proposed. And so sites um, selection, if you like, is a is a complicated thing. But there's also there's things like you know. Let's go with seismic activity is one thing you've got to be thinking about as well as infrastructure and all these other things. But in the same way that we have CERN, an underground um, particle Mm -hmm. um, accelerator that obviously straddles a couple of countries, in the future, in about a decade or so, we expect to have an underground um, European instrument as well. How can we make science more approachable? How can we make science communication better so that you get to have your 400 kilometer <laughs> piece um, in 20 years from now so that their funding is not <clears throat> a huge discussion anymore because there's society behind mm-hmm. it. So what can we do to make science more approachable? I think it's all about having a chat with people and just actually realizing that, you know, the people behind it are just passionate about this side of things. Let's say, you know, it, um, I'm a very, I would like to think that I'm a very normal person. I just have a bit of a weird job and I just happen to have found myself here. And I'm very lucky of all the opportunities <laughs> that I've had along the way to get to where I am. I didn't particularly have special schooling or anything like that. So I would really argue that this career can be for anybody um, with an interest and, and the desire to apply themselves, let's say. You don't need to start off knowing that you want to search for the future gravitational waves when you're five. You just might know that you really like maths or you really like building something and you just got to harness that excitement. So I think it's about giving people and especially children and the coming to generation the opportunity to 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 pursue passions in these different areas, but also see that there's a future in it. Um, you know, that um whether it is academic or whether it is industry, you know, you need all these things to work together in order to be able to do this. So Whilst mm. applicable research, let's go with, let's just say a cure for cancer, everybody could get behind that because, you know, you can really see the tangible mm-hmm. benefits of it. In the same way that I've just been chatting to you about some spin-off technologies and stuff like that, I think that's a really important thing to be able to say that, you know, this weird experiment that was looking for gravitational waves actually led to this, this, this and this that we see in our society that, you know, was led by these people. And the wonder of science, the mm. wonder of astrophysics is never going to be in dispute. We're always going to be able to create and excite that passion. Humans always are going to be looking up in space, but I think it's the really being able to relate to everybody on everybody on the street, really. Um, you know, you have a conversation with somebody on the train, being able to explain what you do in terms of explaining why it's going to be beneficial for them and understanding that, yes, it might cost them like a cup of coffee or something like that over the course of a year or five years or something like that. But, Mm. you know, Mm. it will lead to these kind of like different things or these different understandings. I think if we just sit here and just say we need to do science for science sake, it's that's that's good for nobody. But, oh, Mm. really explaining everything. And like I said, just making it for everybody. I think it's all about making it relatable. Um, Uh I think or telling somebody why it is beneficial to them is second line of defense in 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 my opinion my first line of defense is to create that fire within anyone out there uh, to have a proper and strong narrative around as we're talking about right now gravitational waves if you i think telling a random person on the street that their ruler <laughs> is not the ruler they think it is because it's bending it's shifting shape and it's measuring different measurements all the time if you look extremely closely i think this could produce or put a grain of inspiration in people's minds maybe i'm being naive right now but to me this is what science is all about science is not about the benefits i get from it science is all about the awe mm. it creates in my mind and showing me the futility of my endeavors on earth because I'm irrelevant mm-hmm. in the in the bigger scale of things. And, you know, if I, if I can reach somebody in that sense, that is wonderful. And, you know, that's the reason why I got into what I'm doing. But let's just, I'll use my mom as a good, as a good example, um, who, mm-hmm. 
is interested in what I do, but she very much wants to know what the application is. I think she wants to know, like, you know, like, what will it do for her or what will it do for her grandchildren or something like that. But when I can explain to her that even though it costs X, Y, Z to build these instruments, that, you know, you'll get your money back in all these spin-off technologies or all yeah. these other things, then it's like, oh, okay, then. So, you know, taxpayers' money isn't wasted, let's say. Um, that ticks mm. her box, whereas, you know, it, for my dad, it would tick the box of exactly what you said. It's for doing it for the wonder, for understanding who we are and our innate um, desire to be adventurers and explorers. And, you know, we just keep pushing the boundaries of what we know. Um, I think um, my my boxes are ticked if someone tells me that my world is not the world I think it is. <laughs> and I think this is what science keeps telling us all the time. Um, and this is the beauty because all the convictions and understandings I have about the world are being tested and pushed to its limits by science all the time. And then once in a while, someone comes around and tells me everything is completely off and everything is completely different. And then we follow and we we build a new world around that new understanding. And I think this is what ticks my boxes, uh -huh. that the world is a, as your space-time, as my space-time, it's a very dynamic place. It's not what it was a second ago, mm -hmm. and it will never be uh, what it is right now. I guess a nice way to actually look at it as well, in a very similar way to what you're saying, is looking at how science curricula has changed over the decades. We're teaching very different things that we were teaching, say, back in the 80s, and that's because of what we've learned along the way. Science isn't static, it's constantly changing, and so it yes. does feed back into society in various different ways. Still, we live in a pre-Einsteinian yeah. world when it comes to basic education at school. Uh, we're still living in a Newtonian world. Um, when it, because I mean, like, it's I, because you need some crazy math to understand Einstein. Yes. <laughs> um, they don't want to teach tensor calculus at school. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I don't know. Maybe they they would understand it. So, anyways, uh, Laura. Um, on a completely different note, um, would you be available for the next travel to Mars or Venus or wherever? <laughs> would you be ready to board a spaceship? I always said that I would. Um, I, it, oh, yeah. It's, I, I, I do remember very vividly um, when I was in year 10 in school. So this is when you were about 14 or so. You're supposed to have gone work experience or something like that. And I remember filling in the form, handing mm -hmm. it to a teacher saying that, you know, I wanted to be an astronaut. And he, I remember his response went, oh, I like a challenge. Um, needless to say, I didn't do my work experience <laughs> in being an astronaut or anything like that. I did something much more boring. But it's something that I've always been extremely mm. excited about. Um, every now and again, when you see candidate selections for things like, you know, being an astronaut for ESA or something like that, you know, you get a bit of, oh, maybe I could do that or something like that. And mm. I don't know. Um, I've recently had a, a child, and so right now I'd probably say I couldn't get mm -hmm. on a, I wouldn't get on a, a rocket or a space <laughs> shuttle. Um, maybe if he's yes. older, maybe maybe I don't know. Um, I guess my sense of um, adventure has been yes. put on pause. Risk -taking. Yes, risk taking is on pause until um, yes. I guess I'm a little bit older, yes. let's say, or something. So um, in my younger days, definitely. Right now, no, but I'm so excited to see when that does happen. Let's just play with the idea because the reason I'm asking is that um, we created a playlist for the future space traveler on Spotify. <laughs> and I'm asking each guest Ooh. for their one tune they would want to contribute to that playlist. And this is a real playlist out there. So which tune for the very boring journey to Mars would you induct to that playlist oh gosh that's a really because good question you feel super bored and um, hmm, interesting <laughs> um but i guess a song that just kind of pops into my head and it's just one that i love just because it kind of always gets me up and dancing around so i guess if it could get me up and floating around and put me in a good mood would be um i want to dance with somebody by whitney houston that's not taken so it's not spacey at all i was trying to think of something no, it's spacey great. but um yeah, it's just something a bit different. And yeah, like I said, it always puts me in a happy mood. It's a, it's a long journey to Mars. You can loop it. Um, 
One more question, uh, Laura. This place, the podcast is called Space Cafe Podcast. Oh, yeah? It's a coffee place. Um, and now and then in coffee places, um, you have an espresso to energize yourself, to energize your body. But this is a podcast, of, obviously. So why don't you share an espresso for the mind with me, with the audiences, something you feel like that could be an inspiration and a shot of energy to audiences. You can pick whatever kind of topic you want to pick. Oh, oh my goodness. That is such a wonderful and deep question. Um, I, I guess in some sense, I'll, I'll, stick, I'll stick on topic, I'll stick on theme and stick with gravitational waves right now. So whilst I might have just mentioned previously, there was three men that won the Nobel Prize in gravitational waves. It was made very, very clear that whilst they were obviously figureheads for the, for the detection, It was very much a village effort. You know, it took scientists from across the world, scientists from very different walks of life to actually come together to build this technology. Science right now is not not usually people in little rooms with their blackboards coming up with an idea and going like Eureka or something. It's <laughs> about mm -hmm. people with engineering backgrounds, people from um, data science backgrounds, people from... You know, um, they might not even be scientists. Um, I know people from all sorts of different walks of life and we're all coming together for the same common goal. And I think it's really quite nice when you kind of bring all these kind of different ideas, these different cultural differences to work on one singular problem. And it's utterly wonderful to see everybody working together in that way. Sometimes in a bit of a cynical world, it can be really nice just to hmm. to separate just that kind of like idea that Right now, I'm awake and I'm doing this, and someone's waking up on the other side of the world trying to go at it in the exact same way that I'm trying to go at it, and people are trying to tackle the problem in a different way. But if you like, we're all one big dysfunctional family working together to do the same thing. Um, mm. Gravitational waves, for instance, isn't a competition in the same way that, say, astronomy might be. Our instruments don't compete with each other. We work together. And so by working together, I think it's the best thing to actually do these big science experiments to come up with these, these ways to tackle some of these big problems. Hmm. There's so much we can learn from, from science, from big science, uh -huh. because without collaboration, there is no discovery. Yes. And in that world that we're experiencing on a global scale right now, Collaboration is all we need, mm -hmm. I think. This is this is the magic potion for our future and current needs and when it comes to climate change yeah. and all those spin-off collateral issues that come with it. Yeah. Collaboration. And and that kind of collaboration we can learn from big science. So that's a very beautiful inspiration. Thank you for that. Yeah, no problem. Wonderful. That was really inspiring, Laura. Thank you so much uh, for taking the time cool. and being on a podcast. Thank you for inviting me. If today's discussion has sparked your curiosity, I urge you to keep questioning, keep exploring, and keep gazing at the stars. Because in the words of Carl Sagan, somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. As always, thank you for tuning into the Space Cafe podcast. I'm Marcus, signing off until our next cosmic adventure. Until then, stay curious, my friends, and keep reaching for the stars. Mm -hmm.